So my name is Craig Polly and I am a beamline scientist at the Block Beamline at Max 4. So the main job is to keep the equipment running well and to make sure that when external researchers come in that they get the results that they need to the best that we can deliver. Most of us working here at the Beamline also have a background in science and we also do a lot of science actively and I think that's the way to keep the equipment going. So, so this, this study with the honeycomb silicon carbide, it actually started in a completely different direction. And where we ended up is not at all where the, the idea was in the first place. So where this began is there are some, there's a, a very talented group in Chalmers who were growing thin films of this tantalum carbide on silicon carbide. And they had this really nice idea that if they do this and then they anneal them to make them nice high quality again, at the same time graphene would grow on the top. And their interest was in using these for transport measurements and studying the properties of the films themselves. And where they originally approached us was they said, well, there should be graphene on the top of this. Can you study the graphene and tell us, tell us about it, tell us its properties? So when we had a look at it, the, the surprising thing was that it didn't look like graphene at all. And we were really puzzled by this. It looked, whatever it was, it was very beautiful, but it clearly didn't look anything at all like graphene. So that began a long process of trying to figure out, okay, well, how do we, how do we reconcile this? Uh, what is it? What does it mean for their studies? And can we come to some understanding of what this is? And it was a long process to get there. And when we finally arrived at the answer, to our happy surprise, it was this 2D honeycomb layer of silicon carbide, which is a material that people have been trying to make for a while. It's one of these family of 2D materials. And for a long time, it was thought impossible to synthesize. And completely by surprise, at random, we, we seem to have stumbled upon a way that you can produce it and to make it in high quality and importantly to make it on a large scale. We were confused about this for the longest time because we were looking at this and we thought, again, this is really beautiful, but what the heck is it? Because it's not graphene and it's supposed to be graphene. So what is it? So we started gathering as many experimental clues as we could, and they start to point you in a certain direction, but they don't give you the final answer. And I would say the aha moment was when we started doing some theoretical simulations. So there's a technique called uh, density functional theory. And what that allows you to do is tell the computer, I have this arrangement of atoms. Can you please tell me what the electronic structure should look like? And basically in a brute force loop, you can give it a bunch of structures and say, what would this look like? What would this look like? What would this look like? And eventually you land on something that matches what you measured almost exactly. And then you realize, okay, I must have got the structure right this time. And the structure that does that is this uh, monolayer silicon carbide. And it also nicely enough agrees in every other respect with all of this, these subtle experimental clues that we've gathered. So then at, at that point, all of the pieces fell together and everything was nice and consistent, but there was this aha moment and it was the computer simulations that did it in the end. So what's, what's a little bit unusual with the honeycomb structure is that if, if we take the analogy with graphene, graphene is this wonder material that just has incredible properties um, and there's, there's huge research efforts worldwide. And what happened when people started to play with graphene is they thought, this is so good. What if we could come up with other materials that are like it? And one of the ways that you could do that is just start thinking about changing some of the carbon atoms in graphene with other things. Can you do an equivalent thing with silicon, honeycomb silicon? Can you do it with lead or germanium? And in all these cases, the answer has usually been yes, but it's a lot harder to make. So I guess the advantage is once you can get it into this form, it's very thin. It's a, it's a monolayer, it's one atom thick. And the electronic structure of it has some, some fairly interesting properties. Um, for silicon carbide in particular, in contrast to graphene, Graphene is, is wonderful in a lot of ways, but it doesn't have a band gap. So it's very challenging to do things like make transistors out of graphene, whereas silicon carbide should have a very large band gap. 
So it offers some sort of complementary properties and we're increasingly realizing the, the research community that you can do really interesting things by stacking together 2D layers of different materials. So in that sense, the more, the more things that you can add to your library, the more flexibility you have to make interesting structures and to, to find some interesting physics. We should be clear that the research that's done at this beamline, uh, and it, it applies also to this one, is very much in what you would call fundamental research. So it's not the case that having done this, we're going to see it in a computer chip next year. It's more exploring what's possible and trying to figure out what the materials of the next 10, 20, 30 years might be. So it's, it's, it's very much exploratory. The, the idea is that now that you can make this, you can start to figure out, okay, what, what exactly can I do with it? Can I peel it off and have one layer? Can I modify it in some way? And depending on what you learn there, then there might well be applications for things like different transistors, different sensors, um, optoelectronics, lighting. It's, it's all still in this field of novel electronic devices, I would say, if, if we get to that point. Sometimes you come in and you have a result in mind and you're fixated on that and that's what you're homing in on. Um, and that's fine, that's perfectly valid, but there's, there's also a style, let's say, of doing science that's very exploratory and you're not sure what's going to happen, but you, you, you have some hunches and you keep your eyes out for anything that seems surprising and unusual. Uh, so you, you need that, which is about the person and the experience and the mindset. But once you do see something unusual, what you'd really like is to have as many tools at your disposal as possible to test different ideas about, okay, well, so I see this, it doesn't really make sense. Ah, but if I could do this measurement, then it would tell me if it was this or this. And Block is one of the beam lines where we can, in a lot of cases, do things like this. We can go to wildly different photon energies. We have these uh, backup techniques already in the chamber. Uh, in the specific context of this study, uh, what we can leverage at Bloch is the flexibility that it offers. It has a, a lot of stuff going on. It's not just for ARPAs. It has connected preparation chambers that allowed us to do the heating, the high temperature heating that we needed to do. It has a coupled scanning tunneling microscope, so then we could do all of the investigations of what the surface looked like without having to take it out of vacuum. Uh, and the, the properties of the energy resolution when you're doing angle resolve photo emission and some of the energies that it reaches basically just allows you almost the complete tool set available for modern surface science. So then we were able to gather really a lot of clues that were in the end quite important putting the pieces of the puzzle together. My hope and my belief is that the, the material is interesting enough and the quality of the samples is high enough that it, people will be motivated, a lot of people, more than just us, will be motivated to start looking into this. And then it will be fun to see where it goes and who takes it where. <laughs>